please find a comfortable place to sit. Place your hands on your legs. Close your eyes or keep a soft focus on the screen. Take a deep breath in and out. A deep breath in and out. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Feel relaxation flowing down from your head into your neck, into your shoulders, down your arms, and into your hands and your fingers. Relax down into your chest, into your stomach, and down your legs, into your feet. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Okay. Welcome to the ninth lecture of my happiness class. Today I address external sources of happiness. Ultimately, all feelings are going to be determined within. So that isn't something that ceases to exist when you're looking for happiness without. We all perceive the data, but it's our interpretation of that data, the meaning that we give that data, that creates a feeling. Feelings are in response to our interpretations, our judgments. And that is true whether you're looking for happiness without or within. So that being said, though, there is a difference in where we look. So when we're talking about external sources of happiness, that means that we are looking for external experiences that we believe are going to make us feel happier. Common formula for gaining happiness is if I were X, had Y, and achieved Z, I would be happier. And we fill in our own values for the X, Ys, and Zs. In other words, if I were better looking, if I were smarter, if uh, I had a different gender, we believe that those things would contribute to our happiness. If we had why, money, 
different place to live, different relationships. Those are all of the values that we put into this formula. And if I achieve Z, graduated from college, got a, a good job, perhaps uh, a great project that, that you had, and you achieved that, that we believe it will contribute to our happiness. So we all plug in our favorite values into this formula and sometimes change them some of the time. But we're, almost everybody is placing their bets on this formula to some degree. We, in moments of doubt, we might reflect on whether our formula is working for us or not. And of course, there are always going to be those moments of doubt. But few people are going to completely disregard the formula. If I were X, had Y, and achieved Z, I would be happier. And of course, all of these things are mostly external. So the common formula for happiness, where we put in our, our own values, is still the same for most people. And it is mainly about looking outside for our happiness. In this court, in this cl uh, class, and in, in this lecture, I am turning more to science, to what the findings of happiness research have to say about various external sources of happiness. That we are they actually increasing happiness or not? So I'm going to rely on the science, but happiness is subjective. And this has been part of the uh, problem that in happiness research is that they're researching something that cannot be directly observed. They rely on surveys, asking people about how happy they are. And of course, what people mean by happiness varies wild, widely. And... Um, Therefore, it's that whether you're actually assessing real happiness levels or not um, isn't, isn't really known. They are subjective, but better some evidence than none. Something that has been shown time and time again, and this is a, definitely a, a truism, they call it the progress principle. And pleasure, this is Hate, I'm quoting him, pleasure comes more from making progress toward goals than from achieving them. And when we're making progress, more pleasure than actually getting there, achieving it. He says, another quote, the human mind is extraordinarily sensitive to changes in conditions, but not so sensitive to absolute levels. So once you actually achieve something, the mind is no longer engaged in it. It was engaged in the seeming progress towards something that we want. What that means is, is that it isn't really the goals we want, it's the progress. Um, this is an observation that is uh, well established in happiness research. We are also lousy at affective forecasting. We're always predicting, I'll be so happy when. I'll be so happy when I make it to the weekend, when this semester is over, when I can get to the beach, when I get a new kitchen floor, when I get a new car. We're always predicting, I will be happy when. But usually whatever happiness we feel was never what we were forecasting or thought we would feel. I will be happy when. The when becomes the now. And uh, you're not feeling that happy. 
maybe a little bit better, but not as happy as you thought you would be. And as Haight says, we grossly overestimate the intensity and the duration of our emotional reactions. And this is rather interesting, I, I find, because in other words, we are predicting how happy we'll be. I will be happy when, and we may be wrong a million times, but we still do it. It's part of the human condition, if you will, is that we're always saying, I'm going to be happy when, and maybe feel a little bit better, but nothing close to what we thought we would be. And this constantly happens through our lives. That's almost a definition of insanity. I spoke about hedonic adaptation in an earlier lecture. And here, it's, I'm going to bring it up again, because it is very important to understand. Now I'm going to ask you a tough question. Would you rather win a million bucks in the lottery, or become a paraplegic? It means that um, you're paralyzed from the neck down. Would you rather win a million bucks, or become a paraplegic? Now give it some thought. I'm not going to push you to answer this one. Um, I don't hear anyone saying, become a paraplegic. And I suspected that answer. But as Haidt also says, quote, within a year, lottery winners and paraplegics have both on average, returned most of the way to their baseline levels of happiness. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? But that is what the research shows, that they return to their, their baseline within a couple of years, at uh, winning uh, all that money or having a, a, an unbelievable tragedy happen to you, you return to your level, you bounce back. And that is something that's been noted actually by, by uh, some of the philosophers from hundreds of years ago have said this, that somehow tragedy does not necessarily stop us from becoming happy again. Great luck is not going to keep us happy. In this regard, there's been a, a lot of research into what happens to people when they win a lot of money in the lottery. It's very interesting. It says that most of the people who didn't have much money to begin with and then won a lot of money, most of them have very little money or are broke within two years. Strange finding. But as far as what happens with, with uh, winning money, th there used to be a show, and, and uh, it was a, a television show, and there was this uh, guy, I, Michael Anthony, I think it was his name, and in the show, he worked for a, a multimillionaire who wanted to play games with people. So Michael Anthony would come to someone's door, someone he didn't know, and they didn't know him, and told them that a benefactor was giving them a million dollars and hand them a check for a million dollars. And I'm talking about a TV show back in the 50s. A million bucks was actually worth some money back then. A million bucks. And the show was about what happened then. It never actually showed a great deal of happiness coming out of it. Of course, it's, it's a TV show. But the research shows that um, not actually getting much out of it is the basic fact for most people, a large number of people. Once I read about um, a man 
and his brother being arrested on the side of the road here in Delaware. They were having a fist fight. The story was, is that one, one of them had previously, years previously, had won a million dollars in the lottery. One of the problems with winning a lot of money like that is that you're going to have a lot of people calling you up and knocking on your door asking for money. You know, that they, they need money for surgery for their children or, or some heart, heartbreaking type of situation. So people asking for money and his family did the same thing. Was asking, asking for money from him. And it angered him. He developed very poor relations with his family and he moved to Florida and won a million dollars in the lottery again. And it was after this, though, that he was arrested on the side of the road having a fist fight with his brother. It hadn't improved his life at all. In fact, it seemed to have gotten a lot worse. And I've read a number of, of unbelievable cases. A, a man in West Virginia winning uh, several hundred million dollars and ends up with his wife living him, his daughter overdosing from drugs and everyone in the town thinking is a big jerk. Life didn't get better. And there are story after story about this. So it may be fun to win some money and of course what's going on in your mind? Well, I, I, I would be wise about it. You know, I, I would I'd just do the things that, that make sense. And of course, I will give some money to my family, etc. But statistically speaking, um, lives don't get better from winning in the lottery. Part of the problem is, I spoke about this before, the hedonic treadmill, which comes from hedonic adaptation. Hate says, Always wanting more than we have, we run and run and run like hamsters on a wheel. I brought up this hamsters on a wheel idea before. So we're always running more and more. We get things, but it's not enough. Now we want something else and running and running and never going anywhere. And in light of all the books, about how to get rich, powerful, loved, and, or slim, Csikszentmihalyi asks, what would be the result afterward in the event that one did turn into a slim, well-loved, powerful millionaire? Usually what happens is that the person finds himself back at square one with a new list of wishes just as dissatisfied as before. Sounds kind of depressing, doesn't it? But if I were X had Y achieved Z, there's the formula. And if you achieved all those things that you wish for, you'd end up with a new list and dissatisfied as before. And this, of course, is based on the research. But what about money? Being very well off financially is a primary goal for over 70% of college freshmen. That being well off financially has, is higher on the list and things like you know, peace of mind and uh, other things. So money is a major concern. And when I turn to the subject of money, a lot of my students say, look, you know, you can tell me all you want that money doesn't, doesn't buy happiness, but it sure does help a lot with things. You know, and it, maybe you have to be somewhat wise how you spend it, but, you know, you, you're going to have a better life if you have money. And that is what most students believe. Most people believe, apparently. And it is true that if you're living in 
deep poverty. Homeless have no security of, of, of eating or a home to stay in. That getting enough money to meet those needs. Have an airplane flying by. Having enough money to get out of that insecurity does make you happier. Having basic security that you can meet life's needs and pay the bills, yes, you, your happiness does improve. So to saying that money can't buy happiness, well, if you're, you're destitute and homeless, that you can actually increase your happiness by having some money. But beyond that basic security that money can give you, that um, money doesn't seem to improve levels of happiness much. And that is the research, is that uh, having the difference between having $20,000 and $20 million in terms of happiness doesn't seem to be very big. Oops. The research isn't showing that money is, means that much. The research does show a small bump in happiness among the wealthy, but they're not sure if it's the money or the fact that they uh, feel better about themselves, that they've, they've achieved some things. So it's not necessarily the money, but they say there is a small bump. Bobomirsky, and I'm going to quote again, says, Studies of how people with higher incomes spend their days find that they don't spend time in any more enjoyable activities than their less prosperous peers and, in fact, are more likely to experience daily anxiety and anger. Martin Seligman says, at all levels of real income, people who value money more than other goals are less satisfied with their income and with their lives as a whole. Of course, this is a matter of how much you value money. And an internal decision about where you're going to focus. It isn't saying, talking about have, how much money you have happiness, but how much you value happiness does not make you happy. How much you value money is not going to make you happier. The economist Richard Easterlin noticed and observed that life satisfaction is indicated in national surveys, and they've been doing this for, for many decades, life satisfaction surveys, if you will. But life satisfaction did not rise with the substantial increases in national wealth over the past six decades. Over the past six decades, the amount of wealth, the amount of stuff, the amount of money, the uh, amazing things that technology now allows people to do, improvements in many ways, many things in the external environment due to a great expansion of national wealth did not increase happiness. Happiness levels stayed the same level while wealth and the things that you could buy vastly increased over that time. And what I found interesting is, is that some people have gone out to uh, people living in primordial conditions, uh, living in, in huts and tents, etc., out in the wild, living as our ancestors did. There are still people living in, in those conditions. And what they found was is that those people seem happier than most people in modern, rich societies. 
that with all we've gained in terms of, of wealth, the comforts, hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing, that uh, we can make our, our homes easily warm when we need it or cold when we want that. All the stuff that we have, the, in, the uh, things that, miracles of medicine, all those things we've had, and we haven't become happier. People living in conditions without any of those things are happier than us. Sounds kind of depressing. We've made no progress in happiness. We've made a huge amount of progress in almost everything else. But not in happiness. And it gets worse. Seligman is the quote. Mounting over the last 40 years in every wealthy country on the globe, there has been a startling increase in depression. Depression is now 10 times as prevalent as it was in 1960. And it strikes at a much younger age. We're not just not getting happier. We're getting more depressed. With all these inc this in increase of wealth and technological wonders, for some reason, depression is spreading. Stefan Klein, depression is threatening to become a, the plague of the 21st century. Cheek sent me high. In the heyday of his material splendor, our society is suffering from an astonishing variety of strange ills. I ask my question, I ask my students the question, what do you think is going on here? Why are people becoming depressed? And a lot of them have, have uh, ex experiences of depression and anxiety attacks. It seems to be increasing. Ask them what's going on. And I do note that, you know, um, you have all this contact with people because I see that you all have smartphones and you're looking at them quite often. In contact with people, you have all this, this information and probably hundreds of friends on Facebook and the other type of social media. Are you happier because of that? Something's going on. And that is the question, why? So, a new term is technology addiction. Is that what's causing it? I don't know, but there's definitely something going on that depression is spreading while all the other things, I mean, even, even the uh, social relationships and, and conditions have really improved from the past. But we're not becoming happier. Apparently, we're becoming more depressed. Now, let's turn to Conditions, let's say, of conditions of the body. And um, I'll include the mind here. But someone who is considered beautiful, of course, is going to be a, a lot happier than people who don't see themselves as beautiful. Not. No, beauty doesn't make you happier. Beauty does change how people act towards you quite often, but that isn't always something that brings satisfaction as well. People who um, are proud of their beauty are often somewhat afraid of losing it, having more days when they don't feel beautiful having a, a bad hair day or, or, or something, and that they're always comparing with others, seeing someone else 
who they think is more beautiful than them. Better looking, same thing with males as well, is that being proud of, of, of how you look and, and your attractiveness does not make you happier. In fact, it comes with a whole load of problems in itself. This need to compare and the superficialities of it becoming aware that um, you may be very attractive, but nobody's actually looking at you. They're looking at your body. What's behind that body, they're not seeing. So, no. How you look is not associated with happiness. Which is good news for those who, who don't think that they are attractive in any way. Well, it's not going to hold you back from happiness. It's how you see it and how much you treasure that. What about intelligence? Well, more intelligent people are happier people. Not. Intelligence doesn't improve your chances for happiness either. More intelligent people have their own problems. One thing I can say you know, for myself is one of the problems is, is that you tend to live more in your mind rather than experience life in any uh, broader way. Living in your mind is not going to make you happy. That's uh, constantly thinking, and thinking is quite often the problem. I knew a man who, very happy person, one of the uh, happiest people I've met. I, I think he's actually uh, one of these people who've reached a certain enlightenment, if you will, and uh, talked to him. But he works with disadvantaged ch children, mentally disadvantaged children, and uh, organizes them uh, for playing sports and other things. So he, he works with these with these children to help them become happier, to have more of, of an outlet. And I asked him, do you think these kids are not happy because of their disadvantage? And he said, they're just as happy as anyone else. That happiness does not, not come from those things. And what he's noticed is, is that um, they're no different than anyone else when it comes to happiness. Some of, some of them are unhappy, some of them are, of them are happy. Their disadvantage doesn't seem to make a difference. Some food for thought. But what about success? prestige, power, etc. Well, you might guess that those things are not associated with higher levels of happiness. And that is what the research findings show, that those things are not associated with it. Now, what about achieving things that you think are worthy? Well, it, it kind of depends there. But I'm going to read a quote by Robert Holden. Achievement for the joy of it is healthy for your motive is love and your worth is never questioned. Achievement because you need it is problematic. One of them is achievement for the ego. The other one is just an expression, expressing what is already there, the joy. A big difference. So it isn't necessarily the achievement itself. It may just be the engagement and enjoying it while you're doing it. But you, many people believe, I'm working in uh, a city and it'll be great, I'm, I'm going to retire, I'm going to go out and live in, in the country, or I'm going to move to a place that have, has a much nicer climate, let's say Hawaii. I used to be sometimes thinking about the uh, a Caribbean island, but they're getting too many hurricanes now. So people think, when I move to a 
uh, more beautiful place, better quiet, better climate, maybe some, some beaches, more peaceful, then I will be happier. And the research doesn't really support that. There's a, a woman who spoke of always needing to move. She moved around a lot. She said that she would move to a new place and it'd be great for a while. She really enjoyed it. But within a pretty short period of time, she was dissatisfied again and had to move again. And everywhere she went, this would keep happening. She said, and then I realized, wherever I move, I am. Realizing that the problem wasn't where she was living. It was with her and her attitude about it. A good insight. When we go around the world, we can see places that have a lot of crime, warfare, poverty, and so it doesn't matter that we're living in a rich, democratic society with far less crime and far more amenities, far more security in our lives. You would think that that would make a big difference. You think, okay, well, we're going to measure the happiness in, in these countries where there's a lot of poverty and, and especially war. And yes, in those countries, happiness levels are lower. But surprisingly, not that much lower. You would think so, but actually not much lower. Right? Um, one, of the, one of the things that I've found interesting, my uh, son um, has studied abroad a number of times, and wherever he went, and he was going down in, into South America, and he saw a lot of poverty. But he said, Dan, I don't know, um, those people seemed happier than we are. They were poor, didn't have much, but for some reason they seemed happier. When I was going to high school, my final years of, of high school, I was living in San Clemente, in California, on the coast. You know, a nice place to live, but a new student appeared, and he was from Mexico, and I got into a conversation with him, and I said, Boy, I bet you're glad to be in America. He said, Not really. What? And he explained that he came from a poor village in Mexico, in a village where the entire village did things together. All the women washed clothes on the river. The children all played with each other. It was a big, happy, social family, despite their poverty. And I found that this has been described many times by people who move into a rich country. For example, there were uh, a number of, of Germans uh, who had lived in, in behind the, the wall of communism who were allowed to move into rich, democratic West Germany. And what they found was is that there seemed to be a loss of cohesion, of togetherness with family, and in society, it was just seemed like everyone for themselves, an individualism that they hadn't experienced before. And they found that they were less happy. So, social conditions may play less than a role than one might think. In teaching political theory and, and political philosophy, I have focused on the idea of utopia a great deal and had students read uh, utopian literature where society, imagined societies, have done away with all of the problems. There is no poverty, 
There is no want. There's no reason for crime because everybody has everything that they need. A society where there is complete equality, where there's complete justice, where there is nothing but social harmony, this dream of the perfect society. But George Orwell says this of utopia. Nearly, nearly all creators of utopia have resembled the man who has a toothache and therefore thinks happiness consists in not having a toothache. In other words, it's the same problem that you get rid of all those items on your, your list that you thought were bothering, bothering you and you achieve all of those. But then you write back with a new list. That same psychological way of, of, of thinking that we're never satisfied. Once we get what we want, we have more things in our list. Well, yeah, that was great, but now we have to take care of these things. And that is just how we human beings seem to be. Never really dissatisfied. Always having new things we need to accomplish and achieve and get before we're truly happy. Hamsters on a wheel. What about relationships? And here I have the good news, according to Happiness Research. Lyle Bomirsky says, of the happiest participants of the studies in which she participated, that they devote a great amount of time to their family and friends, nurturing and enjoying these relationships. And this is a, this is a very strong finding in happiness research. That, yes, having relationships with a lot of people, uh, enjoyable relationships, is highly associated with greater happiness. So, yes, relationships do matter when it comes to happiness. As an external source, relationships are high on the list of where you might want to focus to be happier. The research does definitely shows this, right? What about marriage? What does the science, the findings of happiness research show about marriage? Haight says, A good marriage is one of the life factors most strongly and consistently associated with happiness. Of course, you will notice that we have a high divorce rate. Lyle Bumirsky says, After the wedding, husband and wife get a happiness boost for about two years. Hey, two years is better than nothing. Marriage, therefore, is associated positively with greater happiness, but it necessarily doesn't necessarily last. And as I said, um, there seems to be a lot of problems with the high divorce rate. Marriage does seem to help. Relationships definitely help. So that's the good news. There are some things that we can do to become happier in our in focusing on external things. Another aspect is that being engaged in life is something that in tasks and causes that I thought to be meaningful, especially in terms of when you feel like you're serving other people, yes, you are happier. That contributes to higher level of happiness. So, perceived happiness is associated with being involved in, in tasks and, and causes that you believe are meaningful 
important and are going to make the lives of other people better. It feels good to do good is truly something that is backed by the research. So yes, being engaged in something that you find meaningful and you believe is going to make a difference in the lives of others, go for it. That is associated with happiness. And Seligman says, if one's work is seen as a calling, it is the most satisfying form of work. If what you see what you're doing is part of your mission in life, something that you were meant to do, yes, you get greater happiness from that. And of course, when you're engaged in, in things, you can also feel flow. So, you should bring that up as well. Is that being engaged in, in things, even uh, things that aren't necessarily meaningful, finding flow, you're feeling some happiness. I have a deal for you. I'm involved with a, a company that has alien contact. And they have perfected a, a uh, sophisticated brain reader and stimulator similar to in the Matrix. It creates a totally believable virtual reality. It's like maybe many of you haven't seen the movie The Matrix, but People are living in, in, in pods and uh, at computers feed, feeding their brains to, to create the illusion that um, they're in a reality, just like the reality we have now. And of course, everyone believes that they're in that reality. Well, this machine can do this, but here's the difference. Is that this huge computer can read your mind. It can read what you think is going to make you happier. It's going to read your, read your mind, discover your deepest desires. And then it will stimulate our brains to create the totally believable reality that you get your desires. You get what you want. A totally believable illusion, but you're going to believe it when you're in it of a world in which your deepest desires come true. So the happiness machine can create the realistic illusion of everything you want externally. It can control your feelings. If getting what you want in the external world is going to make you happier, this is a good deal. If it isn't, if um, those things don't make you happier, well, you're not going to be happier in the machine either. But, think about it. It may be that, that um, you say, well, you know, is, is this machine fallible? No, I mean, it's, it's alien technology has been uh, tried out uh, by 200 different planets. It works. Don't worry about it. And while you're hooked to the machine, your body will be in stasis and it will be kept alive and healthy for the natural span of your lifetime. Probably longer because there will be no stress on your body. So, you will be gone from everybody's lives, but you won't know it. They'll still be there in your virtual reality life. Think about the possibilities. You want the perfect partner. You want to be surrounded by people who love you and adore you. Uh, success and Anything that you want to have, whether it's in business and, and sports, a high prestige career, fame, easy to do. You can have it. Fabulously wealthy, you got it. Power, hey, you can be king of the world or queen of the world. Because what's impossible in a virtual reality? You can have it all. You can have superpowers. Think about that. You want to be able to fly? You can do it. You want to have super strength? 
you can do it. You want to have x-ray vision like Superman. Any superpower you want. The one power you don't have is, is to make yourself happy if those things aren't making you happy. But you can have anything you can possibly imagine. The sky is, isn't even the limit here. So, you say, well, that sounds boring. Winning all the time is boring. Well, this machine is going to read your mind, say, okay, you're bored. I'm going to create some challenges for you so that you won't be bored. You can't have too perfect of a life. You won't believe it. So, I'll, I'll give you some challenges. Whatever you're displeased with, that is what you'll get. It will read your mind and give you what you want. At least externally. As I said, it can't make you happy. But if those things will make you happy, it's a good deal. So here's your chance. Think about it. No, really, I, this, this is uh, a project, if you will, a thinking exercise that can actually make you think about yourself and what's important in life and what you want. When we gather to discuss students' answers in my class, very few of them take me up on the deal. And of course, they had to explain why. Many of them say, I don't want to leave my loved ones behind. I said, well, you're not going to know that you're leaving them behind. They're still going to be with you in your virtual reality. He says, yeah, but I would know that they're, I'm not going to be in their lives. And I think that's a pretty good reason. And one of the reasons for rejecting it that I am secretly pleased with is when students say, you know, our problems in life and striving have some sort of purpose, and we would be missing that. And I am pleased at that type of insight, that yes, that uh, uh, living life with all of its problems may actually have a purpose, and you would be missing that. Still, some of, some of my students do take me up. Especially when I change it up and say, okay, rather than being gone for a lifetime, how about a month? Right? That, uh, it's kind of like a, um, a movie about the man going into virtual reality and going to Mars. That you can have a month of a virtual reality. Now, a whole bunch of students do want to take me up on that. You know, having a little adventure and then going back with their lives and, and their loved ones, etc. But it is, think about it, if the external things you want will make you happy, you will be made happy in the happiness machine. If they don't, well, I guess that's not going to work for you then. So think about it. Next lecture, I turn to internal sources of happiness. And I hope that you join me. Namaste.